Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1. Who is like a wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. So he says, who is like a wise man? Who knows the interpretation of a thing? In, in light of man's fallen nature, he's saying, who is capable of comprehending the purpose and meaning of life? There are, there are very few truly wise men, few who can speak of the world, world and the works of God. He, he's already made it very clear that without God's help, no one can fathom the meaning of life. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the revelation of the Word of God, nobody will understand what their purpose in life is. It requires God's Holy Spirit to illuminate our darkened understanding so that may, we may realize that we're living in, in a, um, a spiritually darkened state without Christ. You know, Paul would say to the Ephesians that they actually were meandering, walking aimlessly, without purpose because they didn't have a relationship with God. And so what God has done is he's given to us the Bible, which is a light unto our path. It's a lamp to our feet. It illuminates us, not only on the outside, but also on the inside. God's word provides for us understanding of the purpose and meaning of life and the direction that we're to take. So without God's help, no one understands, no one can fathom life's meaning. Life's purpose and meaning is something that is revealed to us. In Luke chapter 10, verse 21, Luke writes, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. For those who pro were professing to be wise and those who surrounded them saying that they were, the things of the kingdom were actually not disclosed. These things of the kingdom, Jesus said, were disclosed to the innocent, to the babes, to those who understood their need for direction. And so that's the key. So this means when, when someone has proper wisdom, there's going to be a dramatic result. Even his appearance may change. That's interesting how he says in verse 1, a man's wisdom makes his face shine. The sternness of his face is changed makes his face shine. Um, to shine speaks of his demeanor. Uh, it speaks of his appearance. He's saying joy brightens his face. That's what he means when he says a man's wisdom makes his face shine. Joy brightens his countenance. Why? Because he's no longer miserable. He doesn't walk around with this, uh, this attitude like everything's against me. You know, I, I don't know how many of you remember um, Winnie the Pooh, any of you? You know, Eeyore. Remember Eeyore? Anybody remember Eeyore? Am I speaking to myself? Eeyore. You know, oh, you know Eeyore? It's all going bad. You know, I've had Eeyore friends in my life. You know, Eeyores. Well, you know, when the Lord is working in your life, there's a joy. Yeah, there's a sobriety, yes. We're sober-minded indeed. But within us, there's a joy because my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life because I'm just passing through. Because though I may be going through something, these are light afflictions and they're going to be swallowed up with the reality of being in the image of Jesus Christ. And so there's something that keeps you going and, and that's the knowledge of the Lord. And it can actually cause you to have a changed disposition. You can look different to people who have known you best. And that's true. And let's say, what are you up to, man? What are you smiling about? Well, you know, I don't know. I just got something in my heart. The Lord is doing something in my life. And so he's saying his face will shine. The sternness of his face will be changed. Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit's broken. And so he says when the man is gaining the wisdom from the Lord, he, his whole disposition and even his appearance can be transformed. In verse 2, I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. So he begins to give counsel concerning our relationships, interestingly enough, with governmental authority. 
When given orders, we can have a variety of responses to the commands that are given. We can first, we can, we can disobey the orders, but if you disobey the order, you're going to pay a price. And that's in just matters of authority. I mean, you know, if the judge tells you not to go from a certain place at a certain time, whatever, and you do and violate, well, you end up going back to jail, right? If you're in the military and, and the officer or the sergeant in, in charge gives you an order and you don't do it, you're going to end up doing extra duty or you're going to end up spending time uh, behind bars. That's what happens if, if you reject orders, you have a tendency of having to pay. So when given orders, we can have a variety of responses to the commands. One, we can disobey the orders. We do pray. We, uh, actually, we do pay the price for doing so. Now, with that said, and again in context, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Keep the king's commandment. Of course, there are times that disobeying orders need to take place. There are times. Uh, you can work for a company that decides to print and distribute pornography. You may be a salesman who's tasked with the assignment of going and selling this. As a Christian, can you do that? There are those who argue that they do because it's just their job. But there are other Christians who say, no, why would I promote something that enslaves people? I can't do that. And so there are times when you actually will say, no, that isn't something I'll do. Uh, I was working in, in a place, Marie and I, uh, had been married for a while, and um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember if we already had Corinne or not, our, our daughter. All I know is I needed a job, and, and I was working in a place that was only about a mile and a half from our, our apartment. We used to live in Roland Heights, and, and I was working at this place, and uh, I needed the job to provide for my wife, and I believe, for, yeah, for my Corinne, because she was born. And, um, and I... I had the responsibility of loading and unloading trucks. And then when they had will calls, I had the responsibility of giving to whatever the person, giving whatever the person had come to get. I had the responsibility of giving them. And we had to write down uh, uh, the tear weights on, on the packages and all. And so they had told me certain boxes weighed certain amount. And then I find out, uh, actually inadvertently, I, I, I didn't intend to find out. It wasn't like I was looking but somebody had come for a will call, and I had, I, had, uh, I asked my boss, I said, again, what is this, this box weigh? And he says, give him the, uh, bill him for the actual weight. The actual weight is 25 pounds. And I said, actual weight. Because it turns out that I was signing a bill of lading saying that a certain amount of weight was being uh, sent out and on. We were paying for a certain amount of weight on the vehicles when, in fact, we were shortchanging the carriers that were distributing the materials that we were sending on the carriers. And, and that was amounting to an awful lot of money that the company I was working for was ripping these people off for. And I, I drove home at lunchtime and I spoke to my wife and I said, Marie, they have me signing my name on, on bills of lading, violating my integrity because I'm lying when I write this down. I've been doing that every day without knowing it. And we had a baby. We had bills to pay. And I said, I have to quit. I said, what do you think? She said, you have to do what the Lord leads you to do. I said, okay, you go to work. No, I, I said, because oh. <laughs> that's what he told me for you. <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husband as unto the Lord. And... Uh, <laughs> And so <laughs> I went back, I went back and I quit. I went back and I quit. I spoke to the, my, my overseer and I said to him, um, I'm quitting, I'm giving you my notice. I'm not gonna stay working here. And he goes, why? I said, because you have had me violating my, my, my integrity. You have, you, have, you have had me violating my name and, and my name matters to me. My integrity matters to me. I'm a Christian. And so the, I quit. You know, I went home and I told Marie, I said, we're, I'm without money. We're without a job. Uh, but we, look, we, were, we were less than a year married. And, uh, you know, bills don't stop needing to be paid because you're not work. A lot of you know that. And I told Marie, I said, I'm not going to violate my name. 
I'm just not. I was trained by the Lord and my father that my name means something, and I won't do that. And, you know, I think it may, it may have been a little while until I got another job. I, I, think your dad, I think Marie's dad actually gave us a gift to help us pay our bills and stuff because I was looking for work. I couldn't find a job. And then one day somebody called me up and said, there's a, there's a job available. I went and I, I got the job and I was able to pay my bills. But, you know, I, I made a hard choice. I, you know, when you've got a young, young baby and you've got bills to pay, uh, th- I just made the choice. I'm going to honor the Lord and he'll take care of me. I did that long before I became a pastor. So you work for a company that decides to do something or encourages you to do something wrong. You know, well, I don't obey those orders. Your boss may expect you to take clients out for dinner and drinks, and I won't do things like that. They may say when the phone rings and you answer and they say, is Jerry there? And you look at Jerry, your supervisor, and Jerry says, no, tell him I'm not here. I've been in that position. And I'll hand him the phone and say, you tell him. (laughs) Because I'm not lying for you. You know, minimum wage isn't enough for me to lose my integrity over. It's just not. Yeah, and I've, I've told them before I was a pastor, I would say this, I don't lie for you. That is not part of my job description because honoring the Lord matters. Uh, we, we recently, or not so recently, a while back now, we, we heard of a county clerk who was asked to, uh, or actually demanded to issue marriage licenses uh, for same-sex couples, and she refused. She could have gone to jail for that kind of thing, but she said, no, that's violating my conscience, or you work in a bakery, you're asked to make a wedding cake for same-sex couples, and you refuse, you get sued, could lose all your business. Why do you do that? You do that because there are some things that you refuse to do. That's why. And there are times when, when you will reject an order, and you do that because of conscience. We, we are to make decisions that are motivated by our faith. We do the things that that we do because our faith informs us. Uh, Peter and John are at a gate called Beautiful. It's recorded in the book of Acts and in uh, chapter 3 of the book of Acts. And, and there is somebody there who's laying at that gate who is crippled. And Peter and John, uh, the apostles, are walking in in the hour of prayer. And as they do so, the man looks up to him and, uh, and uh, Peter, Peter says to him, look upon us. And the man looks up to him and He's expecting to receive something. We know the story, and Peter says to him, silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say unto you, rise to your feet and walk. And the man lifts up his mat, and he begins to walk, and he begins to leap, and he begins to praise God, and a a miracle has occurred. People knew this man. He had been at that gate for a long time. Peter, looking at him, gives him that command. But later on, they're arrested. They stand before the religious authorities. And it it says in Acts 4, 18 through 20, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, (laughs) you judge, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I was invited to go to high school to give a baccalaureate. I might have mentioned this a while back. And they said before I went, a teacher approached me before I went up to speak. The teacher approached me and said, you know, you can't use the name of Jesus here. You can't. It's a high school. It's a secular high school. You can't use the name of Jesus here. Baccalaureate? Baccalaureate, it's a worship service. That's what baccalaureate is. It, 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 all the way back in the history of having baccalaureates, it's always been something that was a religious service, but now you can't use the name of Jesus. And she's saying that just before I go up, and I'm not Mr. Rebel anymore. I'm not. Somewhat, but not that much. And so she says, you can't use the name of Jesus. And I still remember going out, there's, there's you know, these, all these students there, and I said, you know, you've spent time going through classes. You've learned a lot of things. Mathematics, English, you've learned literature, you've learned science. You've, you've gained a lot of knowledge in your four years of going through high school. If you've been a serious student, you've learned a lot. But I'm here to tell you about what you really need to know, 
What you really need to know is Jesus Christ and sins forgiven that come through him. So for many years, they didn't invite me back. But you want to know something? I, there, you, you do what your conscience commands you to do. How can I give a feel-good message? I can't. I have to give a message that gives you a reason why you can feel good, and that comes through Jesus Christ, you see. So you, you have to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. So under ordinary circumstances, we are obligated to submit to proper authority. Um, that is because as believers, we realize that our allegiance is really to God. And so when he says, again, in verse 2, keep the king's commandment for the sake of, of your oath to God, uh, your vow, your oath to God, that's another way of revealing that our true allegiance really is to him. In Colossians, in chapter 3, verse 23, Paul said, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men. But goes on in verse 3 and says, do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not Take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. When he says, do not be hasty to go from his presence, don't withdraw yourself from the king's service out of discontent or frustration. Do not persist in doing something that is wrong. Don't obstinately reject his orders. Um, in a practical way, uh, you have a problem with the decision your boss has made. Uh, you leave the room and people are gathering together. They're complaining. They're grumbling about that. Well, instead of joining with them, remember, he's the boss. And ultimately, he's not doing anything or she's not saying anything that violates your conscience, your faith in Christ. So do your job. You know, a whole lot of, uh, of uh, problems on the job would be solved if people would simply remember that they're employees. You get paid for what you're doing. And, and, and when I was working before I was uh, pastor in this church, I can tell you, you know, they paid me the same amount of money. It was an hourly wage. And I may agree, I may not agree with what they wanted to do as long as it didn't violate my conscience. I got the same wage. They didn't ask my opinion. They didn't tell me, can you come in and direct our footsteps here in this company? So if they said you're going to do something, I wasn't one of those guys who would walk out into the in another room with everybody and saying, man, I can't believe this. Why we have to do this? I just thought, well, we got to work. We got to work. It's a job. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not the boss. I get the same amount on my check. But there are other people that take it so personally. He's saying, don't get caught up with that kind of thing. Don't, so get, don't get so upset. Instead of joining with those who are griping, just remember who the boss is. And also remember that that he or she may have information you don't have. So don't judge. In Proverbs 18, verse 13, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it's folly and shame to him. There are some things that, that your boss knows that you don't know, and there are reasons he's or she's having you do this, so simply do your job. In verses 4 and 5, where the word of, where the word of a king is, there is power, and who may say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. A wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Well, seeing that he uh, has authority, there, there's really nothing you can do to prevail against him anyway. Uh, this person's word carries more weight, um, and so it's obviously going to carry more weight than the word of a servant. So in verse 5, by following his orders, you actually preserve your job and avoid problems. Proverbs 13, 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Notice how it says in verse 5, a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Uh, instead of acting on emotion, a wise person waits until the proper time to act. In uh, Proverbs 14, 29, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. It's always good to restrain your emotions, hold back, don't react so quickly. Some people are very quick to react, and then they make the big mistakes doing that. Verse 6, because for every matter there is a time in judgment, though 
the misery of man increases greatly. So discernment is exercised, giving us wisdom as we make our decisions. Things can get worse before we know exactly what to do. So again, refuse to act impulsively. Verse 7, for he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will occur? He doesn't know what will happen. Who can tell him when it will occur? Nehemiah in the Old Testament is a good example of someone who refused to act impulsively. When you read the book of Nehemiah, you discover that Nehemiah was an officer in the court of a Persian king by the name of Artaxerxes. And when you read through the first chapter of Nehemiah, you, re you read that, that he had received a report that the Jews in Jerusalem were in distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem was broken down. The gates had been burned with fire. Well, instead of acting impulsively, for many days, the scripture says, he, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And then in God's timing, he stood before the king. And as he stood before the king, he was his cupbearer. The king looked at him and he says to him, What's wrong? Your face is sad. And Nehemiah says in his book, he says, I'd never stood before the presence of the king with a sad countenance. And, and he was afraid. And the reason he was afraid is because if you bummed out the king, you'd lose your head. And so there he is, the cupbearer and all of that. It's a high position in government for him. And he's sad and his countenance could affect his life. And so what does he do? Well, he prayed. He waited for the Lord and the Lord directed him. And so in God's timing, uh, as he stood before the king, he received permission to go and do the work that he desired to do in the city of Jerusalem. Now he was concerned, but he didn't overreact. He waited on the Lord to direct him. Psalm 27, verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. One of the things that you learn as you're growing in maturity is that God's timing is perfect and your impulses are not. And for me, I, I'm somebody on, on a personal level, personal illustration, I am not an impulsive person. I'm a person who waits. I wait on the Lord because I know that if I act impulsively, and I'm not talking about acting quickly, because when I know what to do, I do it quickly, but I don't want to act impulsively. Just say, oh, I got to do something. I'm actually, whenever something's going on that's heavy, um, you probably won't know it. You know, <laughs> example, this has nothing to do with spiritual things, but an example. A couple, few years ago now, we were eating at the house, at my house, and, and I was eating a piece of meat, and when I started to swallow it, it got stuck in my throat. I've never had anything stuck in my throat like that before. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm thinking, hmm. And that's really what I did. All of a sudden, it goes, mm hmm. And I'm thinking, hmm, I can't breathe. That's what I'm thinking. I can't breathe. So I get some water, and I try to drink it just to, and the water just doesn't go, and I actually spit it all out on the floor. And... So I say, well, that didn't work. And I stood up and I walked from where I was seated past one of, the, one of my sons-in-law who were sitting at that time was sitting on the couch and I just walked past him. He doesn't look at me. He was busy texting something. And I walk into the kitchen. My son David was there. And my son looks at me and he says, Dad, are you okay? And I go, and I shake my head, no. And I, I forgot the universal thing about choking or whatever. I don't even know how to do it now. But I'm choking. Now, this has been 30, 40 seconds already, at least, because, you know, I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> so I'm walking, and I go, and I shake my head. Are you okay, Dad? No. So my son gets all like, oh, no. And he runs over, and he tries to do that Heimlich thing. He doesn't know how. <laughs> so he's hurting me. <laughs> and now it's going on a minute. And I haven't breathed. And I, I, I hadn't, I didn't take a deep breath. So you can imagine I'm starting to, and finally my son-in-law 
looks at me, and he's a police officer, and he knows emergency things. And finally, he puts his phone down, just finishes. <laughs> and he comes, and he does the Heimlich, and out it comes. And so that's why I'm here today. He's my hero. <laughs> but I use that illustration to say acting impulsively wouldn't have done me any good. It would have burned up the oxygen that I had already, and it would have panicked everybody. It just, it just never wise, even in critical things like that. My disposition in the Lord is slow it down, don't speed it up. But there are a lot of people who speed it up. They'll speed up. The, I have to do it. We've got to do it right now. If we don't do it right now, it's not going to happen. Well, that's not true. That's not true at all. What you're doing is you're going to get yourself in a position of making a bad decision, and then you're going to have something worse than your plan. So wait on the Lord. And you say, but how do I know when God's saying to move? You'll know. God has a way of orchestrating things so there's a peace in your heart, and you'll know now's the time. Let's go for it. When we bought this property, we came and looked and at this property, I used to, with my family, we would pull our car up right across the street and pray. We actually drove onto the property and drove around looking at it, praying and seeking the Lord long before we owned it. It was a year before we actually bought this property. I didn't tell the church for months that we were looking to do this because I put it before the Lord in prayer so that when we actually got this place, we knew that it was the Lord who was saying, pick up that property. You always, do, you always need to wait on the Lord, and that's right what he says. Psalm 27, 14, again, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And wait, learn to not be impulsive in your decisions and actions. Verse 8, now again, I mean, by the way, I should say this. Just because I didn't get weird when I was choking doesn't mean that you shouldn't do everything you can to survive. I don't want you to walk out and say, oh, I'm choking, but that's okay. You're all, by your, you're all by yourself in the house waiting for somebody to bust in. <laughs> I hope they didn't give you the wrong directions there. Okay, where are we again? Okay, verse, verse 8. Um, no one has power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. No one has power in the day of death. There's no release from that war, and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. Ultimately, everybody dies. And after we die, we stand before God in judgment. At that time, all of our decisions will be judged by a righteous and fair judge. It's been said, death is the great equalizer, because all die, and then all deeds are examined. So death is the one thing that is inevitable, no one escapes it. Psalm 89, verse 48, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Job 14, verses 4 and 5, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. It is appointed unto men to die once after this judgment. So no matter how powerful the person may be, he dies. Solomon had already said this in chapter 2, verse 16. There is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As a fool. So he's making a very clear point. No one has the power of the Spirit to re retain the Spirit, but there's re we need to remember uh, there was one who retained his spirit until he relinquished it to God, and that was Jesus. Remember in Matthew 27, 50, how when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus cried out and again <laughs> with a loud voice, and he yielded or sent away his spirit. Uh, he did this as he was winning salvation for us on the cross because his words preceding uh, those words uh, were, it, it is finished. So Jesus is the one who dismissed his spirit. Jesus said, it is finished, and then cried the cry of victory, it is finished. He's the only one who did that. Well, everyone dies, and everyone will stand before the judge of the whole earth, and it's of utmost importance that we stand before him clothed in his righteousness. Verse 9, all this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun, 
There is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. So when he says all this, all this refers to what he has been speaking about up to this point. He's saying, I've observed these things and I've learned from them. I've applied the lessons that I've learned. I don't want to miss the meaning of my life. I carefully observe things. He wasn't somebody, in other words, who just kind of let life pass him by. He was one of these guys who had those eyes that he was always taking something in, always watching it, always figuring things out. That was Solomon. And so I've observed these things. I've learned from them. I've tried to apply the lessons And then he says in verse 9, the second portion, there's a time in which one man rules over another. Notice, to his own hurt. There are some leaders who mistreat others, and they will end up reaping what they sow. When we go to Israel, we go to an area called Dan, Dan Nature Reserve. And it's really a very amazing place to go. The, the, The area up there, it's to the north. Uh, uh, in Israel, it's in the north going towards the northern border by Lebanon and, and Syria and all. When you go into that area, um, we take a walk through this nature reserve, and it's just beautiful. It's got running water. It's one of the tributaries of the, uh, of, uh, the Jordan and all, and, and you get to see that. And, and as you walk through this place, you go to an area that has uh, uh, Jeroboam's altar, When you read the Bible uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you you read about a man by the name of Rehoboam and another man by the name of Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam had been given a prophetic um, word that he was going to receive a large portion of the nation of Israel, that it would be given over to him to rule because God was going to take the the rulership out of the hands of Solomon's son, Jeroboam. And so it's a long story, and I'll I'll condense it. Um, At a certain point when Solomon dies, um, Jeroboam, who had fled to Egypt, returns, and he comes with a contingent contingent that are uh, representing the tribes of Israel. He comes to meet with Rehoboam, who has been given the kingship of Israel. And uh, and he makes a case to him, and he says to him, "Um, your father... um, uh, mistreated us, overtaxed us, and, and, um, and if, you, if you will be less harsh than your father was, we'll serve you. And so when he takes the, and, and presents that to, uh, to Rehoboam, Rehoboam does something. He, he calls his older advisors in, and he says, this is the demand that is being made of me by uh, Jeroboam and his uh, representatives. What is your advice? And the older counselors say to him, if you serve them one day, they will serve you the rest of your life. In other words, reduce the harshness, give in to their minor demand, and you will retain leadership. But he goes on to say, I'm going to talk to my younger men. And he calls in the the guys he grew up with. And he says, They're saying that I should do this. What do you say? They say, well, treat them harshly. You know, show them you're a man. And so he takes the advice of the younger guys. And when he takes the advice of the younger men, the ones whom he had grown up with, he speaks to to, uh, Jeroboam, and he says to him, my father scourged you with whips, but I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. My father, you know, he, he, it was like, if you can compare the tree trunk to a small finger, the weight that I'm going to bring on you of oppression is going to be manifest much more. And as a result, we see the splitting of the kingdom. And they say, what do we have to do, to do with you, son of David? We have no part of you because there were 10 other tribes. They, they, they fled and they said, every man to his tent, let's get out of here. And they went, and that's when the, the whole, uh, uh, nation was split into the northern and southern tribes. It came because of bad advice and, and harsh treatment. And, and that's what happens when you, when you make decisions that are, uh, that are wrong. And when he says there's a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt, that was a time where he was ruling over others, but the result of the way he treated them and things that were done is he ended up reaping the repercussions 
It's been said, the one who has much from that one, uh, much will be required. So we're going to reap what we've sown. And we do so either here or when we stand before our judge. He goes on in verse 10, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness and, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also, he says, is vanity. So he's, he's reflecting on a funeral he attended. And the result of attending the funeral caused Solomon to think. Remember what he had said earlier, what he had said in chapter 7, verse 2? It's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. The living will take it to heart. Well, he was taking notice of this at a funeral. He, he took notice of the person who had been buried. Uh, this one was someone who had come and gone from what he calls the place of holiness. So the place of holiness can be referring to a position of judge. He was one who administered the law. And the judge is described as wicked, which would mean that he was unrighteous. He had been given a sacred duty, but he didn't honor the office. And though his funeral had great fanfare, well, he was quickly forgotten because he was evil. And so he's saying, I saw this. This is a man who was, maybe something was said at his funeral. They said nice things, but the fact is he was forgotten. His deeds were forgotten because he wasn't worthy of remembering. In verse 11, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Well, this verse connects with the thought that had just been expressed. It speaks, it speaks of people knowing the official was evil and seeing he got away with it. So this means that people see that God delays judgment of the guilty. That can lead to people thinking that God doesn't deal with sin. This mistake can cause people to become hardened in their own sin. So they're saying, listen, I read the Bible. The Bible says a man reaps what he sows. This guy's a liar. He's a thief. He's immoral, and nothing happens. As a matter of fact, it seems like his life is charmed, and he's blessed. That means the things I've learned about God and his moral law probably doesn't apply. Or it, it means that God looks upon it with favor and doesn't have a problem with it. Maybe those conservative Christians, we could bring it to the 21st century, uh, who are so judgmental and harsh, you know, look at these people's lives seem to be okay. You, you say that, that a sinner is going to going to reap consequences, but look at them. They got a brand new car. They have a nice house. Their kids are doing well in school. They take vacations. Nothing happens to them. And you may be the kind of person who thinks if I even have a bad thought ever, then heavens are going to open up and God's going to yell at me and a, and a lightning bolt's going to hit me. And so it seems unfair. And that's the whole point he's making here. Because judgment didn't occur quickly, Men's hearts can be hardened. They think that God must wink at this, but they don't realize that, no, God is giving to this person some space to repent, time to repent, and that's something that we shouldn't take uh, for granted. Bottom line is, is what they're doing ultimately will be judged, but the Lord has a way of giving us space to repent, and so we can see people who go to church, even habitually, they remain unchanged in the way that they live. Instead of becoming humble, they become religiously prideful. And so we think, well, maybe God just closes his eyes to this. No, that's not true. So the application to this, when he says, the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil, the application to this is a warning. Deal with sin quickly. Don't let it become entrenched in your life. Just because the Lord doesn't seem to deal with it immediately doesn't mean it's not going to be dealt with. Somebody said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. So be aware, be aware. Verse 12 Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him, but it will not be well with the wicked. 
nor will he prolong his days, which are a shadow, because he does not fear before God. Sometimes evil people seem to live longer lives. And again, they seem to get away with so much evil. Again, don't take God's patience for granted. Don't mistake it for approval or permission. Be careful not to. You see, the fear of the Lord is what secures God's approval and his blessings in our lives. The evil man may live longer, but he doesn't escape judgment. Even if he lives many years, there's still a shadow in the light of eternity. It's like what James said in chapter 4, verse 14. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Verse 14, there is a vanity which occurs on earth, that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. So wicked people, again, seem to get the praise that should be reserved for the righteous. Uh, he noticed something that our kids noticed. As a matter of fact, those of you who are raising kids when they were younger uh, may remember something that they said to you. My kids said this. It's not fair. That's one of the first things they ever said. The first word they ever said was no. The second sentence they ever gave was, it's not fair. They have this uh, amazing sense of justice, apparently. And so they say, it's just not fair. Um, life doesn't seem to be fair. I I if it were fair, good people would live long lives. Evil would die young. Some lazy thieves live better than hardworking people. This just isn't fair. And in, in some ways, you see that that's part of life, that life seems to be unequal. It, it seems that there are unfair things happening all the time. I was talking to a guy today who was saying to me that he, he, is, a, he is a guy who works construction. He rebuilds uh, bedrooms and, you know, he does interior construction. And he was talking to me about somebody that, that we both know. And he said, I used to work with him. He says, I don't work with him any longer. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He said, he had called me up and asked me to design something for him. He said, so I did. He said, I, I basically ordered all the, all the pieces. It was a construction of some bathroom or something. He said, I ordered all the pieces. I gave him all the uh, ideas for how to do it. He got it all put together. It was, he said, it was so good. They, they, they had some kind of competition and his design, this friend of mine's design and work, actually won a very major competition. But the guy he was working with never gave him credit for it at all. He took all the credit and received all the awards for himself. And so that, I was thinking of that as I was going through this. Life sometimes doesn't seem to be fair. You do all of this, and, and it doesn't work out for you. And so... At least it appears that way, and he's saying it. Verse 14, there's a vanity which occurs on earth, that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said, this is also vanity. So I commended enjoyment, because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry, for this will remain with him in, in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, then I saw all the works of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though, for though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. And so and instead of becoming frustrated over the unfairness, learn to simply enjoy life. The wheel of justice turns slowly. Don't wonder why people go unpunished. Learn to enjoy life for what it is. Allow God to sort out how to deal with people. Listen, if you are always wondering, when are you going to get what you deserve? You're going to waste a lot of your life. You really are. You know, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm at that age now where I realize that there's been, there have been seasons of my life that have been wasted in that way. Just, Lord, what are you going to do with that guy? How can he get away with that? You know, it's wrong, and he doesn't listen when corrected. And, and then the Lord says, you know, 
Let me take care of them. I'll take care of it in my time. And I have come to realize that God has been merciful to me so many times. I'm so grateful that he has extended his grace to me in periods of my life when, when perhaps it could have been, he could have dealt with me quicker, but he didn't. He allowed me to come to the end of myself so that I could finally realize that without him and without his help, everything was futile and useless. You know, you've got the apostle Peter and you've got the apostle John and, and, and Jesus is speaking to the apostle Peter and he says to him, Something like when you were young, you would dress yourself and go where you want to go. When you're old, somebody's going to dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And John says, and this he was speaking concerning the death that he would glorify God with. He was speaking of his martyrdom. And so what is Peter's response to that? You know the story. What does he do? There's John. So he says, what about him? <laughs> Look at it. If I'm going to die, how about him? Can he die too? That's kind of where Peter's mind was. If I'm going to die, how about him? Can we die together? And what is Jesus' response? Keep this in mind. He says, what has he got to do with you? You follow me. I memorized that a long time ago. What has he got to do with you? You follow me. Uh, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he will stand or he will fall. And God, will, and God is able to make him to stand, Paul told the Romans. And that's true. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his master, he answers. And when I've begun to learn that, my life goes a lot better. But as he's speaking here again, he says, a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat and drink. In other words, enjoy your life. He says in verse 16, when I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, I saw the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a, man's labors to labor, though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he'll not be able to find it. And so I applied my heart to this. He was the wisest man alive. He understood that life was beyond comprehension. Now, somebody once said, our knowledge is a receding mirage in an expanding desert of ignorance. God does not expect us to know that which is unknowable. There are simply many things that we can never expect to know. And by the way, an awareness of ignorance is a major step towards acquiring knowledge. When I started going to school as a young man, one of the first lessons I began to learn is the more I knew, the more ignorant I was aware of myself for being. I didn't come out smarter. I came out with more questions. And there's a certain wisdom in knowing that no matter how long you study, there's more to learn. So just keep your hand to the plow, keep applying yourself to wisdom, and watch what the Lord will do. Wisdom is important to the one who wants to get the most out of life. And pursuing wisdom should be our goal. But we need to realize that there's always more to learn. That shouldn't deter us. It should motivate us. Like Proverbs 4.7 Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. The pursuit of knowledge, the knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of his ways is a never-ending pursuit. Don't ever get tired of pursuing the Lord. God's, the wisdom God gives to you is like layers. There's a depth to it. You, you will read the scriptures and you'll get a certain level of understanding. And you can come back to that same scripture a year later and you see something deeper in it. And you can come back a year later and there's more to, because as you begin to plumb the things of the Lord, you start seeing the depth of God. You start taking that scripture and comparing it to this scripture. And then you build up and you get a deeper understanding. And then you get those two scriptures and you see how it ties into this other scripture and so my life has been that as a, as a Christian and as a pastor. The first Bible studies I ever gave back in 1973, the first Bible studies were as shallow as a 23-year-old's Bible studies were going to be. I was only two and a half years old in Christ when I began to try and communicate the depth of the Lord. In some ways, that's just kind of a ridiculous thing when I think about it. And yet the Lord was very gracious and the little surface understanding I gained at that time 
has become a foundation for me of all the other things that he built on that over all of these years. And the first lessons you learn sometimes are the deepest lessons, but they have to be fleshed out by other scripture and other experiences. And then you gain this wisdom and a heart of understanding. And then one day you finally say, Lord, I get it. And then he, he takes you, you die. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and then you see him face to face. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? So don't ever get tired of pursuing the Lord. Don't get tired of his word because in it is life.